um, this talk is actually a reflection of um, my research of the last year. It was already mentioned, um, our institute has like for almost one year, not quite, like a few months are uh, missing, right? Um, we have this research uh, focus now on Jerusalem and um, in this time I read really a lot. There's a lot of research about it, but still I could actually talk also maybe for one or two hours about uh, you know all these kind of things here about Jerusalem and um, the time, but I still don't feel really confident um, in formulating my own research topics here and you know to pretend or I'm just not confident. Okay, this is the point. <laughs> um, it is unfortunately a little bit dark. Can we get this a little bit brighter? Or is it something happening? No. Okay. So here on the screen it looks quite uh, good. I hope this is okay. Um, so I would. First of all, talk a little bit about the historical background and the sources that we have. Then um, I have two parts because they reflect my research, right? So first of all, uh, I will talk about Jerusalem. Um, this is a specific question about the centrality. I will come to this later again. And then um, since only you looking at Jerusalem is probably not enough, I extend also my focus a little bit into the southern Levant, trying to understand what was going around the city actually in this region at the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. So this will be the second part. My research focus, as mentioned, is actually the Iron Age and we can distinguish uh, the Iron Age in different kind of uh, stages from the archaeological perspective. So um, I will focus, is this the point, yeah. So I will basically focus on Iron Age number one and a little bit 2A. This is um, the time, you know, if we look at the historical tradition of uh, Jerusalem, then this is actually the period before Jerusalem became um, part of, uh, or became the, the Israelite capital in some way. And it's actually also before the temple according to the historical sources was built, the first temple period. So by 2a, I include a little bit also of this period here. Yeah. If we try to understand what happened um, in the Iron Age, then we also have to look a little bit what was actually going on in the late Bronze Age. And this is a map um, of this area uh, of uh, Israel, the Levant, actually the Eastern Mediterranean in the late Bronze Age. And the people who lived in this area here are actually known as the uh, Canaanites, Canaanites, I think in English it's Canaanites, I will just say Canaan, <laughs> yeah, the people of Canaan. And uh, they lived in city-states. Um, and there was a hegemony of Egypt at this time. Yeah? Egypt was like an empire, I could say. Uh, in the New Kingdom period, the pharaoh was actually able to extend um, the power beyond the classical area of the Nile River and the Nile Delta into the Sinai, and also here along the Eastern Mediterranean coast. And this is very important because by looking at this, we can understand all these kind of different influences that coming in. So Egypt was very, very important there. Um, we have a polytheistic religion. I'm just mentioning that because uh, when we talk about the Israelites, uh, we have like monotheism coming up and so. But um, in ancient times, before um, the before Jewish religion came up, we have a polytheistic system with um, traceable influences from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, and also from Anatolia. The main god was actually El, or one of the main gods. And I just found it interesting huh, because this is also the, uh, in, in Hebrew terms, uh, this name occurs, for example, in Isa, El, Elohim, and so on. Yeah? So we have this long tradition. And if we want to understand um, the Jewish tradition, also you could say the Christian tradition, looking at these Canaanite uh, Kanaanit gods and goddesses um, is quite enlightening. Yeah? So we have particular names that you can also find in the Bible. Um, they occur there, but in a kind of different setting. Yeah? So some of the gods and goddesses or entities, divine entities, that are described as maybe evil or may volant in the Bible, they're here among the Canaanites, you know, they're normal gods with particular kind of, um, how to say, areas where they are in charge. 
And uh, Yahweh, for instance, the God of uh, Israel, right, the God in, uh, um, specifically also in Jerusalem was worshipped there, was maybe a God of mythology. There's also other um, areas where he was maybe in charge. So also at this time, this name is already coming up. The material culture of the Canaanites, I will talk about it very soon again, was actually very similar, uh, similar, but there are also regional di uh, differences. And it is very likely that these people here that we are uh, summarizing as Canaanites were actually had different identities, had different I ideas about who they are, but we are just projecting this from the outside. But this is uh, a problem that we actually cannot solve here at the moment. And we know that there were trade connections in the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean, also partly in the central Mediterranean. The end of the Bronze Age is accompanied by very big changes in this area. So um, we have this account from Pharaoh Ramses III. Yeah, he reports that in the eighth year of his reign, that was in very likely in 1177 BC, there was a battle against the so-called Sea Peoples, different kind of tribes of people that would attack. Um, Egypt, the pharaoh was uh, uh, successful in defeating these people. Yeah, some of them would also settle along the eastern, uh, eastern Levantine coast. And if you look at the map here, then we see this is actually part of a much, much bigger development. Um, what we see is that in the entire eastern Mediterranean, very um, important sites were destroyed or abandoned. Um, it is the so-called end of the age of internationalization because this is what we see in the Bronze Age. Um, these people knew each other. The rulers would send letters to each other, would ask for support, you know, for resources. They would marry, of course, yeah, um, uh, I don't know, the, the daughter of this king and so on. And all of this comes now to a halt. Everything is kind of finishing. Um, very important centers, as it's written here, are were abandoned or destroyed. We have migration movements of people for sure, and um, we can say it's the collapse of the old order and also the emergence of something new. So part f uh, the first part is now um, about the centrality of Jerusalem, one of my research um, interests. And um, it starts maybe with um, the consideration that Jerusalem was of course a very important city as uh, Professor Munna mentioned, uh, or is important for the three big religions, uh, the monotheistic or Abrahamitic religions in this area. Um, but the question is, what was the city actually, what was the meaning of the city before these religions came up, right? Uh, was it already an outstanding city before? What makes it so special? And um, if you look at Jerusalem, the location is of course important. It is located in the so-called hill country and the hill lands, right? And there's a big difference. We have here the mountain ranges and then we have here the coastal area, which is the plain area. The Canaanite um, cities were all distributed more or less here, yeah, with a few exceptions also in the hill land. And um, the actual core of the, of the city is here on this um, hill. Today, of course, uh, as shown on the map, uh, it's much, much bigger. Jerusalem is a big city here, spanning all over this area. But the actual core of the city was located here, um, the so-called um, city of David. So this is a reconstruction here. We have a palace. We have a fortified um, settlement, um, domestic structures. We have a palace. And we have maybe um, later after David with uh, Solomon the temple. The problem is now. If you want to learn a little bit about Jerusalem during the late Bronze Age and during the Iron Age, um, there are excavations going on or they have been done in the past, but this is not really a lot because as mentioned, Jerusalem is a complicated place, um, not only from the political perspective, but also when you look at all these different um, layers and uh, the settlements uh, activity and so on, um, very often if something is on a hill, the layers can be destroyed later yeah, the, through erosion and uh, people would later build other structures. So getting actually to this very first phase is quite tricky. And we have here the city of David, these red areas. These are the places where excavation took place. And then we have here a few points where we have some traces of the early Iron Age. So that's not a lot. Um, yeah, we have some pottery, we have some structures and so on. 
but to to be really to be able to say something about the city, how important it was and everything, um, we have to do something else. Yeah, because just looking at the structures is not enough at the moment. And of course, we can assume um, particular uh, developments uh, will actually or prevent, of course, further research there. Huh? One of them is, for instance, the Temple Mount. It is a holy place for Jewish people, for Muslim people, and um, excavations, even though they take place, right, but they are not really structured and so, and big research is simply not possible. So that's why we are still uh, not really sure what was it all about with the first temple period, the second uh, temple period, what is the Wailing Wall, you know, what kind of structure is that, where does it really belong to? Um, big question marks and in foreseeable future we won't solve this kind of problem. So. I thought, okay, um, we can also, in archaeology, it's also possible uh, to do something else. We can actually try to understand the centrality of the place. Yeah, a central place, uh, so there's central place theory that comes from uh, human geography, and uh, this concerning the size and distribution of central places within a system. So um, the first time this has been figured out in Germany, yeah, that uh, we have big places, they are evenly distributed in an area and then we have smaller places. And this, uh, so um, if we look at the distribution of sites in a, uh, in a landscape, this is not random. This is actually the point. Yeah? There is a reason why they are there and they fulfill particular functions. And if we have the distribution of all sites, for example, in Israel, then we can also possibly figure out um, if a specific site was very important or not so important and what kind of function it maybe had in the settlement system. Um, centrality is also mentioned and centrality is the relative concentration of interaction. Yeah, so a central place is characterized by a high density of interaction. So if there's a lot of connections to this place then we can assume this is a central place. It is important. Um, so now you can actually, or what I did, I collected all these um, Iron Age 1 sites in, um, in, the Levant, in the southern Levant. And this is actually work in progress, okay? There are m much, much more points that I could add here. Um, what is maybe interesting or important to mention that uh, here we have um, the number of settlements in the Central Hill Country, so here. In the Late Bronze Age, it's not a lot, 29 only known sites. For Iron Age 1, already 254, and then for Iron Age number 2, 520. So we can see that in the late Bronze Age, this area was not very important for people, generally, and it gained importance during the Iron Age number 1. Um, so what I did is I used um, GIS um, software to, you know, to distinguish these places and to make some sense out of this kind of data here. Um, there's one tricky problem, by the way, the red dot here, this is Jerusalem, yeah, just to figure it out. And um, the tricky part now is that um, I have to tell the system which places are maybe the central, you know, which are bigger hubs for connections here. And so I choose this one here, these are um, very famous or big settlements um, that are usually mentioned. The, the, the tricky thing is, of course, if I would define these places differently, then also the outcome, of course, would be different. But anyway, let's have a look what happened here. So uh, one possibility is to use um, so-called Thiessen polygons. Yeah? So the software is doing that automatically. You just have to define a little bit here and there what, uh, what the actual method is doing. Um, all the points are taken, and then uh, you cannot see that here, but the distance uh, to each point, to each neighbor point is measured, and then just in the middle, we draw a line and then we have particular, you could say, catchment areas, yeah? space that is maybe controlled by this central place that we have there. So we have actually a quite even um, distribution here. Yeah, Jerusalem is here, and if you look at the, the size of the area that was maybe controlled by Jerusalem, so that is not too bad, of course. Um, but we have all these other points here, right? All these other dots as well. And now it is possible to um, to figure out the nearest neighbor. So what is actually the shortest connection from a particular point to this central part? And if we do this, then um, we get this result. By the way, this is Jerusalem again. Yeah, there are other parts here. These are um, these kind of coastal cities. Um, and we can actually see that they were not that 
greatly interconnected anymore in the Iron Age or the area that they actually controlled is not that big. Um, but also Jerusalem, if we compare this uh, with this uh, site here, which is um, Tel El Nasbe, yeah, not very famous one maybe, um, but we can see this one has much, much more connections than Jerusalem. And if we uh, make an overlay with uh, these Thyssen polygons, uh, then we see this matches up quite well. The tricky thing is because the algorithm that is being used is very similar here. Yeah, so that's why it is actually not a surprise. I was first, I was positively surprised. I said, wow, this is matching so great. But in the end, uh, just uh, after thinking a little bit about it, it is not a surprise. The tricky thing here, or the problem with that is, um, this is projected like over just a plane, right? There is nothing, there is nothing more. But we have topography here, of course. I talked about the hill country, right? And the lowlands. And if you look, for example, at some of the points that we have, um, for instance here, this point yeah, is actually closer to this area here. But this is just measured by distance or by the algorithm. Actually, what has to be taken into account is, of course, the topography, right? Because we see here we have some mountain range, and it was probably easier for people from here to go to this place instead to here, right? And it's the same here. Um, so this is what this algorithm is not doing. There's a possibility with this GIS software also to um, look more at the topography, but this requires quite a lot of calculation power from the computer. So I hope my, I will try that. Um, as I said, it's work in progress, but I'm not sure if my computer is able to do this in the end. And um, in any case, the expectation is to get something out that is more realistic, uh, because this is just a suggestion, just a model, a basis for discussions. But what does it mean now, in my opinion? So this is also preliminary con uh, conclusion. Yeah? So I would say Jerusalem was at the beginning of the Iron Age before it became actually the capital city. Somehow yeah, it was actually not a very important city in this area. Um, it was of relevance as a local center because we have a high density of interactions, even though it's not as high yeah, as here, for instance. But anyway. And um, it is actually a remote location, right? It is in the hill country. And this makes it, of course, better defensible in some way. But on the other side, it is not an ideal place for trade interactions. It is not that open. Yeah? And I would say, of course, a lot of importance for Jerusalem is, of course, coming them with all these kind of um, uh, stories, the cultural memory that is actually attached to this, right? which is in the Hebrew Bible and, of course, also in later scriptures and so on. So actually, Jerusalem is, uh, in the sense, from the from the way how it is presented, what people project into the city, it is much bigger than the actual location that is there. Okay, part number, that was the first part, and now part number two, and this is about the ethnogenesis in the Iron Age one in the Southern Levant. As I mentioned, um, at the end of the Bronze Age, we have all these kind of changes there, and what we see is that new people are coming up. The Israelites, for instance, yeah, is a, they are a prominent example, people who weren't there before, and they came somehow into this area, or they occurred in this area, and the question is now, how is this all coming together? How can we analyze that? How can we understand what was going on there? Um, just, you know, basic definition, ethnogenesis is actually the process that leads to the appearance of a new ethnos, a new group, on the basis of predecessor ethnic groups with a new self-awareness and self-designation. This is important, right? Ethnic identity is based on that. Um, one thing is also clear, because we heard from Professor Mona, for instance, uh, all these kind of political, um, situa the politi the political situation that is going on there. Um, it is also clear, whenever ethnic identity and all these kind of questions are coming up, they can be, of course, used and also abused uh, for particular purposes. So that's why this is actually a kind of tricky um, topic, I would say. But on the other side, what is also possible to be shown is that, of course, everything is interconnected with each other, right? This is actually also a good basis maybe to find a kind of common ground, a common sense of getting together instead of feeling that um, people have to separate from each other. Uh, one thing or a few things about ethnic identity, uh, because there are a lot of misunderstandings also until today, and we maybe have a very specific um, uh, idea what ethnic identity is, but 
what we see actually it is constructed. This is nothing that is given from above or from somewhere. Yeah, this is not nothing that is really real. It is also fluid. Yeah, people can change their ethnic identity. This is not so uh, uncommon, and. Um, something like racial features, you know, uh, for Germans it's uh, problematic to use the word racial, the term racial in any way, but in, uh, in English language it is used. Um, I think it also has problems there, but people can be read uh, in a specific way. So I can understand someone is maybe coming from Middle Europe, someone is coming from Korea and so on. But also these kind of things where for a lot of people, specifically when we talk about the Mediterranean, not so important, yeah, the phenotype, the appearance, was not necessarily a kind of um, uh, feature or property that, uh, say, that told people, okay, this one is part of our ethnic group or not. So the question is, how can this be analyzed? And there is um, the paper of Sergei Arutionov, I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, um, and he describes actually something that specifically in the Russian school of ethnology was being used. Yeah? In Russia or at the time of the Soviet Union, of course, there were different people. They were also um, connected with each other. So there is a strong research focus on these kind of things. And he would say we have three types of ethnogenesis. One is convergent. We have like two or more groups that come together and form a new group. We have the divergent type. One group is kind of splitting up, maybe in two or more groups. And we have the transformative type. So we have, let's say, group A and group B is joining them. Group A is changing, but based on this kind of influx of another group, but um, still the self-awareness and the self-designation is we are still group A. We don't change just because someone else is coming inside. Um, so this gives us a way to make some basic description of the process. But there's also something else because um, maybe you know group A leaves some kind of traces here, apparently, or group A leaves some traces in group uh, in one and two or something. How is that possible to be described? And here, um, Arutionov uh, takes um, a kind of terminology and a kind of strategy that is known from linguistics. They are distinguishing in, uh, for example, a substrate, adstrate, and superstrate. But here it is about the material culture, okay? Elements of material cultures, customs, habits, and so on that are, uh, that are included in, into the new group. Yeah? So that's why you can also see some kind of uh, continu uh, continuity between uh, different groups and so on. Substrate is actually something that is included and it is very important, but it is not really uh, determining the main part of, uh, of the cultural alignment. Uh, this is actually the oppos uh, opposite of the super straight because super straight is like there is a dominant group and this dominant group gives a lot um, input, a lot of cultural elements into this new forming group. And then we have ad straits or ad stratum. So this is something, um, just the inclusion of single elements somehow. Yeah? So different groups come in touch and one group is just adopting a few elements but they are not so um, so strong, let's say this. Okay, so now if we look at um, the Levant at uh, the time of the early Iron Age 1, we have several groups that we can distinguish. Just maybe going shortly back to the map. We have, um, we have actually much more, but I just chose four of them, okay? So we have actually the Canaanites who would li have lived here. We have the Phoenicians, we have the Philistines or Philistines and we have the Israelites. So I will look at all of these different groups and try to figure out how they are connected with each other. And I can do this very sh brief now, okay? So you have to believe me that it's actually research about the material culture, comparing artifacts with each other and trying to understand you know, how important one is over the other. Um, so if you look at the Canaanites, yeah, then um, research says that the population there was already quite diverse, as I mentioned before, but what we have is a kind of unified com uh, uh, socio-economic system. Yeah, it's based on the city-state and on the hinterland. It also had a stable social environment. Why? Because of Egypt. Uh, Egypt had the hegemony there, and it was, uh, there was not much uh, quarrel or war going on before the Sea Peoples came in. Uh, by the way, this is pottery of the Canaanites, yeah, and uh, I could go now really into the details here, but um, I guess I don't have enough time for this. I have to come to the end part, you know, to my map that I want to show you. Um, 
So we have different, this is uh, like domestic structure, yeah, some of the houses that we know from the Kananites and also, for example, palaces and temples and so on. And you can actually compare that, you can figure out how it is conceptualized uh, compared to the other people. So this is the standard there in this area, good old Bronze Age standard. Um, when it comes to the burial customs, then we have actually quite a big variety. This is always problematic because archaeologists believe um, burial customs are very closely to ethnic groups or to religious ideas and so on, but the Canaanites were quite eclectic. Yeah, they had uh, a wide range of burial customs. So people would be buried in pits, in some kind of cysts, yeah, built environments, also in some kind of rock cut bench tombs, which are usually reserved for the Israelites. And we have this kind of uh, sarcophagi, uh, which are very close to the Egyptian uh, model. Yeah, I just want to show you something that the Canaanites were strongly influenced, of course, by the Egyptian rule. When we come to the Philistines, right, other people, so there are different ideas where they were actually coming from. Uh, maybe from the Balkans, maybe from the Western Aegean, the Eastern Aegean, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, generally, we can say these are actually the descendants and inheritors of the late Bronze Age Aegean world. This is pottery from the Philistines, and it looks a lot like Mycenaean pottery. Yeah? People in the Aegean, uh, in Mycenae or something like this, they would produce something very, very similar. And uh, this is, uh, anyway, a very uh, interesting divider, you know, this kind of pottery, if you compare it with the people from Canaan, um, we can shortly do that. So we have particular shapes here. There's not a lot of uh, ornamentation going on, right? And uh, Philistine pottery is very different. So the shapes are different, the people produced, and also the ornaments are very different. And again, if you compare this with stuff that you find maybe on Crete, on Cyprus, or in Greece, mainland Greece, then you see it's very similar. So the idea that these people were coming from there is actually uh, quite well founded. We also have um, domestic structures, and they can be quite simple. What is very special for the Philistines is that they would have a central hearth, yeah, a fireplace. This is also, again, something that we find in the Aegean, in the Bronze Age. The hearth in the center of the house. We have that here. We also have here a hearth. Yeah, this is a little bit more complex structure here already. But the first houses were actually quite simple, which they would build. Again, something related uh, to structures that we can find in the Bronze Age again. It is not so easy to find, to get uh, burials from these people. Uh, meanwhile, there are some, of course, so this is well, just an example here. The pottery is not so nice and um, uh, decorated as the one that I showed you before, but maybe you can recognize here something. There's a little figurines and these are scarabs. This is, again, um, uh, these are artifacts that were influenced by Egypt. Yeah? So Egyptian gods and hieroglyphs and so on. They were maybe not produced in Egypt, possibly in the Levant, but we can see how this cultural element is very, very strong. Um, another thing is uh, also, of course, the, uh, how to say, the, uh, the customs, the eating customs. And what we can see is that, for example, here uh, among the Phil Philistines, we have Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gaza, is now here, Gath, and um, uh, yeah, Akron. They are usually um, considered to be the main Philistine sites. And here we have actually a high amount of uh, pork consumption, yeah, pork bones or something like this. And in the um, hill land where the Israelites would reside, we have almost nothing. So there is a division between the customs of what is being consumed and what not. Then we also have the Phoenicians, right? The Phoenicians actually lived along a city states along the coast in the northern Levant, but we also have them in Israel. So they are actually at the border between the northern and the southern Levant. And we can say they are, they were the direct offspring of the Canaanite civilization. Yeah, they adopted many, many things or just kept them. Um, so this starts with, um, with the, so they have a pantheon, yeah, it's a, a polytheistic religion, um, the way how they build their cities and so on. So there are many things actually you could bring. The pottery of the Phoenicians can look like this. It's a little bit later than Iron Age 1, but I just, you know, you can see there are some differences. It's possible to distinguish that. Um, domestic structures, so cities, yeah, bi densely built environment. Um, the burial customs are very different, very eclectic. Yeah, this is very tricky for people who research about the Phoenicians. And then we also have Egyptian elements here. 
So when we come to the Israelites, there are different theories how they actually come up. And um, one idea is from William F. Albright, for instance, you know, he would say the compress model, the Joshua campaign that we know from the Bible, is it's all true. The problem is for archaeologists, you know, um, if you read the Bible and try to find the places and see um, what actually happened there in this area, then we see um, it is not really reliable. And the reason is the Bible, the, the idea of the Bible is, of course, not to give an historical correct account of what happened. It's about forming cultural memory, right? It's for keeping people together, giving them a narrative that they can believe in. And that's why we have all these kind of war situations and the interference of God and so on. Um, there are other ideas, so for example, that Israelites were kind of invaders, but not military, so they were actually coming into this area. And something that is a little bit more favored at the moment, yeah, because it seems to be like this, from, for example, George Mendenhall, he would believe that from the Kanani countryside, people who didn't want to live there anymore, maybe dissidents, people who wouldn't accept the rulers of the Kananites, they would move into this hill land. Because that was a place, the only place where they could be. Yeah? That was the place where not so many people would settle. If you look at pottery, then it looks actually very much like the Kanani pottery. Yeah, we can distinguish it, but we can see all these kind of connections there. Um, there's the so-called four-room house that is connected with the Israelites. Uh, four-room, yeah, because we have actually three uh, spaces, vertical and one horizontal. The subdivision can be different. These kind of houses also exist somewhere else. Yeah, the problem is we can say this comes from the hill country, but um, it is not only for the Israelites. We also have different kind of burial customs. Yeah, for instance, the so-called bench tombs. So it's actually a place um, cut into the rock and is used by several people. But we also have a kind of evolution. It's not coming out of nothing. It is actually based on previous Kananit uh, customs. So this is the map now. I come to the end. My time is up. Um, to uh, what I came up with, with the ethnogenesis yeah, of these people. So we start with the Canaanites. So they were influenced by the Egyptians. So this is abstract. Huh? So this is like a kind of influence that was uh, included. Um, Egyptians also got some influence from the Canaanites. We know that, yeah. And so they had this Egyptian um, influence, and we see actually a divergent ethnogenesis into the Phoenicians and I would argue into the Israelites. Yeah, Canaanites also were there, very likely, but they are kind of fading away. Um, the Israelites had so this kind of substrate of the Canaanites, and then we have the Philistines. They were related to the Mycenaeans, and they get now this impact from Canaan and from Egypt, and they would have this super strat stratum from the Myc Mycenaeans, and they have some abstrates from the Canaanites and from the Egyptians as well. And we see that the Israelites have this very strong emphasis on otherness to the Philistines, yeah, because they are kind of uh, strangers coming into this area, so they are really people from somewhere else. But then we also have the strong opposition to the Canaanite uh, tradition. But this is, and this is the, the thing now, it's because they were so similar, actually. Uh, it's not because they were very different. They are coming from the same, they have the same roots. And now these people try to come up with their own definition. They try to separate themselves as much as possible from these, uh, from these people. So that's why we also have development, you know, different religious development, different, um, a different lifestyle, we could say. And when we come to the conclusion, so I would say the ethnogenesis is a difficult word, of Iron Age people in the Southern Levant is based on influences from the outside and the inside, so that's probably not really surprising. There is a high similarity, but also big difference between some of them, and this leads to strong opposition. This maybe, you know, is, is understandable. But this one, if, if two people, if two ethnic groups are too similar, they can even be more hostile towards each other, huh? because they are kind of threaten their identity constantly. There are some papers about that also. Um, and then the differences were based on diverging lifestyles, core elements of Israelite identity are understandable as direct response yeah, to specific customs and habits of the other groups. For example, what to eat, what kind of religion you have, and so on. And with this being said, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thanks a lot for your attention. Um, just four minutes longer. Sorry for this.